We're going to go ahead and get started. There's a, a few people still signing in the back of the room. Uh, you can just make your way up front and sit down. Uh, we want to go ahead and uh, let our presenters get started. He's got a lot of stuff to talk about. Uh, some of the stuff he's talking about happened in the last five minutes. Um, but he's, he's over there revising his talk based on it right now. Our speaker today is Jonathan Cohen. He's a senior national correspondent at Huffington Post. He writes about politics and policy with a focus on social welfare. He's also the author of Sick, the Untold Story of America's Healthcare Crisis and the People Who Pay the Price. Jonathan worked previously at the New Republic and the American Prospect, and he's written for The Atlantic, New York Times Magazine, and Self, among other publications. His journalism has won him awards from the Sidney Hillman Foundation, the Association of Healthcare Journalists, World Hunger Year, and the National Women's Political Caucus. He's a graduate of Harvard, a former fellow with Demos and Henry J. Kaiser Family Foundation, and a member of the National Academy of Social Insurance. His other claim to fame is that he is married to IHPI leadership team member Amy Cohn. So some of you may know her. Uh, Amy is, um, uh, has a, a research center that's part of IHPI called CHEPS, which is the Center for Healthcare Engineering and Patient Safety. And uh, CHEPS and Amy helped us organize this, so we appreciate that collaboration. One last comment before I turn it over to Jonathan is that um, if you're tweeting about this event, we'd like you to include hashtag IHPI17. And with that, I will turn it over. Thank you. Thank you. Well, this is different. Um, so yeah, you know, usually when you agree to give an academic talk, the great virtue is that it's a chance to get out of the daily bustle, take a nice pause, to see the big picture, not to get too caught up in the news cycle. And I am literally telling the truth, this is not making this up when I say that what, what Caroline just said, I was literally rewriting parts of what I'm going to tell you because between the time when I got in my car an hour ago to pick up, where's Peter? There's Peter, my 13 year old, and, and dropped him off with his mom. Mom. Hi. Hi, sweetie. Um, uh, the story changed and then changed again. And I'm fairly certain it's going to be different by the time, at least the politics of healthcare, that by the time I'm done with this talk, uh, it will be different than when I start. So I would urge none of you to, 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 to treat anything I'm about to say that seriously. <laughs> well, maybe I should rephrase that. Don't just assume it's going to be a permanent state of condition. Also, if I sound, uh, those of you who know me, I tend to talk a little fast. I'm a little twitchy. I'm talking a little more quickly and a little twitchier because I've had seven cups of coffee <laughs> since 7 a.m. And you can vouch for that. Or actually you can't, you only were there for the first four. Okay, so where are we? Um, we are at a very important moment, again, literally in American healthcare. And I don't actually think I'm exaggerating when I say that the next 12, 24, 48 hours could have like a profound impact on the direction of our healthcare system because we are about, there is a bill that the Senate is taking up. The, Mitch McConnell walked out of his office a few minutes ago and said, yes, they're going to vote on it next week. Um, and how that vote goes depends a lot on how people react to a new version of it that came out this morning. And having watched this play out before in Congress, I can tell you that sometimes these things are very closely run uh, affairs and it could go either way. And it's entirely possible that you know, one senator declaring, I'm for this, could be what it takes to push it over the edge and kind of create a stampede of support, or one senator going against it could have the opposite effect and uh, cause the bill that's before Congress to fall apart. So this is really a very, very critical time um, and really enormous stakes. Um, so the uh, title of my talk, I think, is The State of the Healthcare Debate. Um, the, we should call it The Changing State or The Uncertain State. Um, but because that's what we're talking about, I need to give a little history, but I'm going to do it super quickly because I know some of you know it already, and the more important question is where we're going from here. But you can't really understand where we're going. You can't understand the debate and what's up for what conversation if you don't know how we got here. So let's start with, we're going to do healthcare economics as quickly as possible. And there are two central facts of healthcare economics that everybody should know. And you may know this intuitively, you may not. But the first one is that healthcare is really expensive. Really, really expensive. If you get sick, if you get injured, if you have a chronic condition, the cost of that medical care is going to be more than almost 
any single individual, and I'm willing to bet every, more than any individual sitting in this audience right now can actually afford on their own. In other words, if we didn't have health insurance and we were asking every person in this room to pay for their own medical care on an a la carte basis, and any of you got sick seriously, and if you seriously injured yourself, and if you had a chronic condition, you would be wiped out financially, you would be bankrupt, and uh, it would basically be a question of do you skip your medical care or do you not pay your rent? And that's what we're talking about. That is a fact of life. That is because medical care is very expensive. It has been that way since the 1920s, which is when our modern insurance system began, um, but has obviously gotten much worse over time. So that's the first fact you need to know. The second fact is that the distribution of medical spending is highly uneven. Now, I just was explaining how expensive medical care is, right? Um, the, the fact of the matter is at any given time, you know, in this room, for example, and guess what, we got about 60 people here maybe? Does that seem like a good guess? Someone who's good with numbers. Does this look like about 60 people here? All right, so what's 20% of 60? That's 12. So, oh God, is that right? Yeah, that's right, okay. <laughs> so, at any given, you know, at this moment, there's probably about 12 people in this room who are largely responsible for almost all the medical spending at this time in this room. And that's because at any given time, most people are in relatively good health. Most people don't need a lot of medical care. Um, but for those 12 people, it's very extreme. And so the question, the sort of central challenge of medical care, of medical care financing is always, what do you do? How do you get those people the care they need? Whether it's the routine care, going to the pediatrician, getting the routine test, getting care for chronic conditions, or emergency care, heart attack, cancer, injury, what have you. Um, and the secret is always some kind of insurance arrangement. You want to spread that risk. Again, because unless your name is Bill Gates or We'll just stick with Bill Gates. Unless your name is Bill Gates, you really can't afford that out of your own pocket. So getting groups of people together to contribute into uh, a common pool to pay that cash, that's the way you do it. That is the best way to pay for medical care, and it's the way it's done everywhere in the world. Now, when I say everywhere in the world, there's an important little asterisk on that, which is that every other developed country in the world decided a long time ago, decades ago, that the for their purposes, what they thought the best way to do it was, was to get everybody pooled together. You live in the country, you're part of it. So you live in England, everyone in England is going to pay into this one pool. You live in France, everyone in France is going to pay. This is Japan, same thing. Wherever you go in the developed world, everybody pays into one common insurance pool. So everybody is sharing. And because everybody is in this one group, it, the, the government has to sort of administer this to everybody. And the government has certain power, right? So the government says, all right, we're going to make sure that everyone has insurance, and we're going to dictate what that insurance looks like. We, different countries do it differently. Some countries let people pick different levels of coverage. Some countries let you actually pick from private insurance providers who are reimbursed by the government. But one way or another, the government's basically defining a basic set of benefits that everyone's going to get. The government is going to pay for this. It's going to raise taxes. It might, you might contribute with premiums separately, but basically one way or another, it's the same way you pay income taxes today, pay for the fire department, you pay for the schools, you pay for national health insurance. Now that gets expensive, obviously. Remember, we were talking about how expensive health care gets. So the government takes it upon itself to regulate prices, set budgets. And so if you are in uh, Germany or Sweden or any of these other countries and you are a provider of medical care, you're a doctor, you're a hospital, you're a drug maker, one way or another, you are not just dictating, you're not just putting a price tag out there. You are dealing with the government or a government intermediary who is either bargaining with you or just dictating to you, this is what you're going to make. This is per service is how you're going to get paid. And that's the basic broad characteristics of all of these other countries. We here in the United States did not do that. And there's a long, very interesting historical story, which when I first thought I was going to be giving this speech, I was going to spend half the time telling you. I'm not going to do that. You can read it in the books or you can find a video of a speech lecture I gave last year when I did that. Uh, but basically, the story is we did not end up with that kind of system. Instead, we ended up with a very different kind of system. Uh, we have a fragmented system. Um, the assumption is that most non-elderly adults will get private health insurance, and they will be responsible for getting it on their own. And for most people, that'll mean getting it through an employer. You go to a job, you sign up for the job, the job says, here, you can have insurance through us. We're a nice big group. We can buy insurance together, get that nice little pooling arrangement. Um, or you can get it through your spouse, you know, maybe, let's say, you just hypothetical example, you work for a publication that's based in New York, but your wife's a professor at the University of Michigan, <laughs> gosh, you know, spitballing here, uh, you know, then that might be how you get your health insurance. They have pretty good health insurance at the University of Michigan, too, by the way, and that's, I'm not getting paid for this, so that's not like a, 
message from a sponsor or anything. Um, so that takes care of most of the non-elderly population. Now, along the way, that, that's how that system grew up out of World War II and various reasons why it kind of became popular. Various policy decisions encouraged it. Um, but you know, it was apparent by the 1960s it was going to leave a lot of people out. The most obvious group was the elderly, because they're not working anymore. If you're not working, how are you going to get insurance through a job? right? So we created Medicare, which covers everybody who's over 65. Um, uh, which covers hospitals, and covers doctors, prescription drug benefits were added uh, about uh, 15 years ago, 14 years ago, 13 years ago, um, uh, a little more than a decade ago. Um, and uh, that covers the elderly. We added a program called Medicaid in the 1960s, the same time we did Medicare, uh, in recognition that there were some people who couldn't get health insurance because uh, they didn't have enough money. Although Medicaid at that time was limited. It was strictly limited to children, uh, pregnant women, young mothers, the disabled, uh, uh, the elderly who could use it to supplement their Medicare. Um, it was not seen as a broad way of covering most low-income Americans. It was there for sort of spot duty on what society at that point considered the most deserving of the poor. Um, and that's how our system grew up. Now, the missing from these groups were people who were working age, didn't fall into one of those categories for Medicaid and had to get insurance on their own, to buy insurance on their own. And, and in general, a, a lot of them couldn't get insurance. Um, there were two reasons for that. One was a lot of them just couldn't pay for it. Again, insurance is very expensive. To give you a sense of today, most people today have no idea what health insurance actually costs because they get through an employer and your employer pays most of it, so you don't realize how much you're paying for it. But, you know, a couple thousand dollars a year, uh, for a, an, uh, a single person's policy is totally typical. If you're making $20,000 a year, finding $4,000 to pay for a health insurance policy, it's pretty much not possible to do. So a lot of people didn't get insurance because they couldn't afford it. But there was a whole second problem, which is that the insurance market for people who weren't part of employers was run very differently than the part that was run for employers. And the following reason. Um, insurers discovered very early on that they went around selling insurance policies to everybody one-on-one. -on -one. The only people who bought them were people who expected to get sick, which makes sense, right? I mean, if I tell you you're going to buy insurance, you can take it, you can leave it. If you know you have, oh, you know, I, you know I'm prone to, to a high blood pressure, or there's a history of something in my family, or gee, you know, I'm a cancer survivor, you're going to want to buy that insurance. You're going to want to pay a lot of money for it because you figure there's a really good chance you're going to need it. But you're 25, you've never had anything beyond strep throat. And you're thinking, do I really want to pay $4,000 for an insurance policy? You're probably not going to. And so insurance companies would get this situation where they'd go from person to person. They'd only get people who were relatively high risk. It became very expensive to maintain those policies. And so to ward off that problem, which is known as adverse selection, they started the practice known as medical underwriting. They would sort of screen you. Are you... You know, are, are you high risk? Uh, what's your medical history? All that. And if they decided you were at risk of generating high medical bills, they would charge you more money, they would withhold your benefits, or they would deny you coverage altogether. In addition, uh, insurers had total leeway in most states to sort of vary what they actually offered you. So, you know, they would sell you a policy, but it's not clear the policy would cover everything. In general, when you get an employer policy, you can be reasonably confident it will cover most of the things you need. There might be arguments about experimental therapies. There might be, you know, as you get into sort of intensive treatment, you might get arguments over whether this specialty visit or this drug. But in general, you knew that it would cover the sort of wide variety of services. When you were buying coverage on your own in the old days, it was very common to buy policies only to discover that, wait a minute, there's like no mental health benefits or a very limited one. Or it didn't cover certain tiers of prescription drugs. Um, habilitative services was another common thing left off. And of course, maternity care was left off. That was one insurance companies very uh, commonly left off because you know, that was something they found if they sold policies with maternity, what they got was an unusually large number of people in their 20s and 30s, particularly women, and they ended up having to pay out maternity. And you know, it, it's not a value judgment on the insurers to say that from an economic standpoint, they couldn't make it work. And that's the sort of problem, the nature of the way this insurance market works. So that was the situation we found ourselves in in the 70s and 80s, when around that time, American healthcare started to get much more expensive than it had ever been before. Employers are struggling to pay for it, people paying on their own are struggling, and we see uh, the number of people without health insurance in this country starting to rise. 
which was a reversal over, you know, from the 1920s up through about the 1970s, there was a steady increase in coverage. I mean, we didn't have universal coverage like they did abroad, but, you know, we were kind of inching our way towards there as a country. And around the 70s, that progress turns around, you see it start to fall off. And that's the beginning of this long discussion of, well, what are we going to do about healthcare? What can we do both to get more people access, but also what can we do to control the cost of care so it's not quite so expensive as it's been before? You know, what can we do about the overall burden this is placing, not just on individuals, but on employers, on society um, as a whole? This discussion kind of went along and um, you know, one idea was to have the private sector just kind of absorb this, do it itself. You know, the employers would find ways to make their policies less expensive. Uh, and, and that actually, they, they had some success. This was the era when they introduced managed care, which if you're young, the idea that you have a network of providers probably seems pretty normal. Most people today, you have an insurance, right? You know to check your network to see, oh, is the doctor I want to see if I need to see a specialist, that doctor on my network. Um, 20 years ago, that was like a new thing. And people were very, you know, not used to that. And in fact, it was very controversial. And to this day, you know, there's a lot of controversy over the extent to which our insurance companies using this to hold down costs or they using this to limit access to care. But that was, you know, that was one of the ways insurance companies figured out to lower costs. Another was to sort of shift more costs onto the individual. It was figured out very early on that if you ask people to pay a greater share of their medical costs, they're going to use less of them, right? That's kind of intuitive. So if I tell you, you know, I'm going to, you can, you know, that uh, a doctor visit is $10 and you kind of have a bit of an ache and pain. The theory is, well, you know, why not, right? You can go to the doctor, 10 bucks, no big deal. If I tell you it's $100, then you might think, oh, do I really need to? Maybe I can sort of, you know, maybe I can kind of put up with this. Or maybe you say, well, yeah, I'm going to go to the doctor, but I'm going to try to find a cheaper doctor who has cheaper fees. Now, Doing that has an upside and a downside. It does mean people will tend to spend less, which is what made employers happy and made insurers happy. The catch is a lot of times people will skip care they need. I mean, uh, from a healthcare standpoint, I don't know how many of you are public health people as opposed to economists. Public health people and economists tend to have very different views on this particular question, you'll discover. Talk to an economist, like, yeah, you know, you know we, we, we need more, 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 more cost sharing, more out-of-pocket costs. It encourages cost discipline. And the public health people are always there waving their hands saying, um, excuse me, excuse me, public health person here. Yeah, it's real nice that people are like, you know, not spending as much on their health care. But we notice that when people don't get their health care, like the things they don't get include like their high blood pressure medication, which is like really bad for them. And then they end up in the emergency room with a heart attack. And not only is that bad for them, but also it costs more money. So maybe this isn't such a good idea. <laughs> and uh, this is one of those debates that goes on and on and on. But anyway, that's how the private sector dealt with this problem. Well, eventually, uh, Bill Clinton was president. He kind of came, he and his wife, Hillary Clinton, came up with a plan that was designed to deal with all this. It didn't pass, but the gist of it was, it was an attempt by the Democratic Party uh, to say, all right, we want to get to universal health care, but you know, we've been kind of banging our head against this since the 1940s, and we can't seem to pass anything. And part of the reason is, that, you know, trying to create what they have over in Europe, kind of a, what would be, a lot of people would call a single payer system, but some kind of really centrally run national healthcare system. This is hard to do in this country. Uh, politically, uh, a, a single payer system, a national health insurance system, like the kind I was describing at the beginning, that would be a pretty radical change from what we have today. And it would really change the incomes, hospitals, drug makers, and doctors. Um, and you know, you may not have noticed this if you don't pay a lot of attention to politics, but it turns out that like the drug companies actually have a little more power than most people in Washington, which is, you know, who knew, right? So uh, drug companies, hospitals, and they, they like, if you like say you're gonna take away some of their income, they get kind of angry. And they start calling members of Congress and saying, hey, guess what? We heard you might wanna cut our, our, our incomes, and that's fine, we're really totally, totally 100% okay with that. By the way, we're writing these really big checks to whoever's gonna run against you in the next election. And members of Congress kind of tend to think twice about that kind of stuff. So, you know, the lobbying power of these interests has made it very hard to pass something else. In addition to that, there's a, a, a lobbying group called the American Public. And, you know, if you wanted to propose to create a European system like system here, it, it, something you'll observe, if you ask a poll question, and, 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 and people do all the time. Do you think we should have a single payer system or should the government just give Medicare to everybody? It pulls off the charts. Everybody likes that because everybody likes Medicare. And, and by the way, on paper, I will tell you, I've, I've been to these other countries, they are great systems. There's a totally authentic, intellectually honest, evidence-based case that 
those countries are getting much better health care for much less money than we here in the United States are. However, that poll question does not capture the full extent of public opinion because the next part of that conversation becomes great. We're going to give everybody Medicare. Hey, by the way, you with the nice insurance from the University of Michigan, that's not going to be your insurance anymore. You're going to get, and all of a sudden, everybody with employer insurance starts to get twitchy. And then uh, you start to see ads on TV. And that's not to say you couldn't do it here, but the point is that feelings are very complicated and attempting to sort of change the system over runs into a lot of political resistance. It's also difficult from a policy standpoint because every part of our healthcare ecosystem is built on the assumption that the reimbursement system will look like it does today. They're used to getting paid the way they are paid now and at the level they are paid now. If you look at single payer health insurance systems, government run insurance systems, there's a myth out there that the biggest reason they say that, that we, our healthcare is so expensive is because of the administrative waste. That's a part of it for sure. And actually, again, uh, having spent time over there, the, I, I think the best advertisement for single payer is to go talk to a doctor in France. I did this once, I remember, I was interviewing this very prominent uh, physician in Paris, and like I walked in the office and there was like no staff there. And I'm like, what's up with this? You know, you're like this prominent doctor and there's like, you have like a part-time receptionist. So like, yeah, I don't, why would I have other people? I'm like, well, don't you have to do billing? Like, billing, what's that? You know, I mean, it's so easy. We have all this overhead here. However, <laughs> there's a saying that every dollar of waste in healthcare is also someone else's income. Um, that money is the whole, our whole ecosystem, our whole healthcare ecosystem is, is, is key to these large fees. So the real reason those systems abroad uh, save so much money is that they set fees really low. They tell doctors, like I was saying in the beginning, here's how much you're gonna make. They tell the hospitals, here's how much you're gonna make. They dictate to the drug prices, drug, drug, drug companies, this is how much you're gonna make. And that adjustment from where they are there to where you'd wanna go is pretty big. And it's a hard, hard transition to make quickly. Something you can do over time, but not easy to do quickly. So recognizing all that, Democrat, the powers that be in the Democratic Party, for better or for worse, not for me to say, but you know, they made a strategic decision roughly in the 1980s and 90s is that, all right, we're not gonna try to just tear down the whole system as it exists. Our goal is gonna be get to get to universal coverage, maybe give the government more power like they have overseas, but nevertheless to kind of work within the constraints of what we have already. We're gonna try to adapt this system rather than blow it up. And that evolution eventually kind of filtered through down to what became the Affordable Care Act. Uh, which became law in 2010 after a long fight and, and really became fully implemented in 2014. Um, and the approach of the ACA, I assume you guys are reasonably familiar with it, but just to do a quick review. Um, again, the idea was to leave Medicare largely in place. Um, there were a lot of changes in the way Medicare would pay for services and the way the government would pay providers in Medicare, but there were no changes to the benefits. And it was done fairly carefully in a way designed so that the people who were on Medicare wouldn't really notice these changes. In fact, probably if you asked someone who is on Medicare, how did the Affordable Care Act change your insurance? The answer is they probably don't know. But if they did notice, the one change they probably noticed was the prescription drug bills went down because the ACA added money to help them pay for prescription drugs. If there was a so-called donut hole in the prescription bug, drug benefit of Medicare and the Affordable Care Act helped close that. So from the standpoint of a beneficiary, at least, Medicare really didn't change much. Sort of the same for employer insurance. Um, there's a little bit of a wrinkle there because the Affordable Care Act did call for changing the tax treatment of employer benefits. And that sounds really wonky, but basically um, one of the reasons we have an employer system as strong as we do is that the government gives extra tax breaks for it. And starting with the Affordable Care Act, they limited that tax break. And this is one of those things that everybody hates except economists. Everyone thinks, everyone, no one wants to mess with that tax break except for economists on left and right. Because economists are in like unanimous agreement, doesn't matter if they're liberal or conservative, that that tax break ends up giving you incentive to get more generous insurance than you probably really want to get. And that's money that comes out of your wages and we're all better off if you don't get that tax break. Which, you know, if you're an economist makes total sense. And if you're like not an economist, you're like, wait, aren't you just giving me less generous health insurance? And you know, one of these debates that goes back. But the, the, so the Affordable Care Act did that. But other than that, it didn't do much to change employer insurance, except that it did add a few consumer protections. For example, it eliminated lifetime and annual limits on benefits, which is one of those things that 
probably, quite possibly, quite probably nobody in this room or at most one or two people in this room will ever matter to them because very, very few people have health care bills big enough to exceed an annual or a lifetime limit on health insurance. The thing is, for that one or two people, it's a pretty big deal. You know, we're talking children born with serious uh, birth defects that will need a lifetime of care. Um, we're talking about, uh, there's a woman I interviewed and wrote about a couple months ago out in California who has an aggressive, rare form of cancer. She, she blew through a million bucks after about four or five months of treatment. And for these people, people like that, there's not many of them. I mean, there are really not many of them. But for that small class of people, having an annual or lifetime limit it, it, it is the ability, it's the difference between being able to pay for your medical care and not, full stop. So that, but those were the only changes to employer insurance. Those are the only changes to Medicare. And you'll notice that I've just described the two parts of the healthcare system that are probably the most popular. I mean, if you ask people what works in our healthcare system, most people say, well, I like my employer insurance and I'm glad Medicare is there. And actually, the Affordable Care Act doesn't do that much to them. Certainly not a lot of visible changes. And even the invisible changes are smaller and kind of operating in the background. Where the ACA really did a lot of work was in two other areas. The first is Medicaid. Now, remember I said that when Medicaid was founded, it really applied to sort of very narrow groups. Now, over the years, various, it was expanded, and various states took advantage of opportunities to expand it more, particularly uh, what you would call the blue states, places like Massachusetts, California, Minnesota. Um, and they would tend to expand Medicaid to cover more services and more groups, partly because there was a greater need. Again, as remember, we were talking about how health insurance was deteriorating, employer insurance getting more expensive. There are more and more people going uninsured in more and more states. They're showing up in the emergency room. They're getting uncompensated care because an emergency room has to, they don't have to give you like full diagnostic. I mean, if you show up at the hospital, they don't have to give you like a whole raft of services. But if you need emergency stabilizing care, they do have to give you that. And that costs the hospitals money. So that money would eventually end up costing the state. So states gradually started expanding Medicaid programs on their own. But it was very piecemeal and only in a couple states. The ACA said, look, Medicaid is a comprehensive insurance policy. It's dirt cheap for the people who have it because there's almost no cost sharing. If you have Medicaid, you pay at most token amounts of money for doctor visits and prescriptions. On the theory that you're talking with people who are at or just below the poverty line. I mean, these are people who can't pay rent, can't pay food. So, you know, they're certainly not going to be able to pay for medical care. So uh, it's cheap for the beneficiaries. It also turns out to be very cheap to run per person. Um, now, there's a reason for that. Medicaid doesn't pay a lot to hospitals and doctors per person. And this is one of its problems, is that if you need to see a specialist on Medicaid, it can be a little difficult because specialist physicians won't want to take it because it doesn't pay a lot. But you know, overall, the evidence on Medicaid is that it's very cheap to run. It provides good cost protection to the people who get it. It does seem to provide better health, although the evidence on that is mixed. And if someone wants to ask me a fun question, we can go down the rabbit hole of the Oregon health insurance experiment. And at least four of you are nodding, so you know what I'm talking about. But you know, this is when you get really into fun, wonky conversations that eight tenths of the room are going to be like, what are you talking about? And two tenths will be like totally invested in. But we'll get to that later. Um, uh, so they expanded Medicaid. And the idea was we're just going give to give states money so they can make Medicaid available to anybody in a household that is at the poverty line or even a little bit above the poverty line. And if I was really good at this, I'd have those figures memorized of what 133% of the poverty line is. I don't remember offhand, but it's like, 13, 20, 26, well, I think it's like 29,000 for a family of three. I have to check that. Anyway, it's poverty line just above it. You could qualify for Medicaid as long as your state opted in. That was the key thing. Originally, it was assumed every state would opt in. The Supreme Court had gave a decision that gave states more leeway not to do it. So today, 31 states plus the District of Columbia have expanded their Medicaid. You're sitting in one of them, by the way. Michigan is a Medicaid expansion state, um, one of the 31. Uh, and then there's this question of the, the private health insurance market for people who don't get coverage from their employees. And it's a funny thing, because this is a small portion of the population. Um, and yet I would say, and even it's all, at most, if you think about the number of people directly affected by the Affordable Care Act, including the Medicaid expansion, including other provisions, it's probably about a third to, to you know, between 30 and 40 percent of the people are the ones affected by this. It's just not that, it's, it's important for sure, but it's not like the single biggest story. And yet, when you think about most of what you've read about the Affordable Care Act, I guarantee you 80 percent of it's about this set of changes. 
I'm talking about the exchanges, the individual mandate, the subsidies, and they get all the coverage. And I just say that to remind people that when we're talking about possible changes to this law, this is a very, very important, but it's also just one part. Now, here's where things got very complicated. The theory, uh, who knows, what, how many of you are familiar with the three-legged stool? Just, uh, I don't know how much you know, the mandate plus subsidies plus regulations. If you know it, raise your hand. All right. There'll be a little review for you guys, but I'll do it quickly. So uh, there, if you want to give insurance to everybody, you want to get everyone into one big pool like they do in Europe, obviously you could just have the government give everyone insurance, which again is what Europe did. It's what Medicare does for the elderly. If you don't want to do that, if you want to provide, rely on private health insurance, you can do that too. That's an alternative, but it's complicated. You need to start with the fact that, okay, remember we said insurance companies were denying coverage to people with pre-existing conditions. They were not always selling benefits that, plans that had all the benefits. Uh, the prices were all over the place. So you have to tell insurance companies you can't do that anymore. From now on, you sell to everybody, regardless of pre-existing conditions. You don't vary the prices based on medical status. We'll let you charge a little more to older people, a little less to younger people, but you can't like vary them by more than a ratio of three to one. And every plan that you sell has to have 10 essential benefits. And yes, that includes mental health. Yes, that includes maternity care, plus prescriptions and hospitalization and all that stuff. And you have to do all those things. So you're basically dictating to the insurance companies, you can no longer practice business the way you did up until 2014. Now, the insurance companies are OK with this in principle, they say. They said, all right, you know, that's a different business model, but we know how to do that. But we got a problem. If you just tell us to do that, we're going to run into this whole thing where people, if we tell anybody, hey, you can get insurance even if you're sick, what's everyone going to do? They're going to wait till they get sick before they get insurance. Insurance companies won't have a way to make money. So say, if you're going to do that, you got to make sure everyone gets insurance. You got to have a mandate, an individual requirement. And so the decision was made that the way to do this was to penalize people. Say, if you don't buy insurance that was available to you, you have to pay a fee to the government. That's the individual mandate, which you know, was the subject of a very big Supreme Court case and has been very controversial. And I think it's safe to say has been the single most unpopular part of the Affordable Care Act, this requirement. So there's that. Now, you impose the mandate. You have the regulations on insurance companies. And now you're sort of running up the problem that, wait a minute, you're going to require people to get health insurance? Well, wait a minute. Let's say we have a family with like making $30,000 a year. It's a family, so a policy for them today is what, $14,000? You're going to go out and tell this family they have to pay $14,000 for an insurance policy that's going to have $6,000 in out-of-pocket spending, and they make three. That's more than half their income you're asking them to pay on health care. I mean, that's, that's crazy. So I said, all right, there's a third stool. The first leg was the regulations. The second is the individual mandate. The third is the subsidies. The government says, all right, if we're going to make you get insurance, we're going to have to help a lot of people pay for it. We're going to have to offer tax credits. So they set up this system where if your income is below four times the poverty line, 400% of the poverty line, which for a family of four is about $100,000. So we're pretty high up into the income scale now, well into what most people would consider middle class. If your income is below that income, then you are eligible for tax credits that will make your premiums, basically a discount on your premiums. And the discount gets bigger the less money you have. So in effect, there's like a fixed percentage of your income you could have to spend on your health insurance premiums. And then as you get lower income, you get kind of lower, kind of closer, what most people call working class, lower middle class, working poor in that range, they actually, the government's gonna throw a little extra money there and say, not only are we gonna help you with your premiums, but we're gonna give the insurance companies money so they can give you special policies that have very small out-of-pocket spending. So to give you an example, there was a family I wrote about a couple of months ago in North Carolina. Um, two parents and a young child. Um, I don't have the numbers exactly in my head, but if I recall, they had about $30,000 of income. Uh, the uh, wife was part-time working, part-time in school. The husband had used to have a job at a lab and was laid off and was sort of juggling jobs between uh, Grubhub and Starbucks. Their family income was about $30,000. They were just a little too much money to qualify for Medicaid. Plus, they were in a state that hadn't expanded Medicaid. But because of the Affordable Care Act's tax credits, they were able to get insurance for about between $1,000 $2,000 a year in premiums. And they would owe no more than $1,000 in out-of-pocket costs. Now, that's roughly two to $3,000 a year in medical expenses. $30,000 in income, that's still tough. Don't kid yourself. But 
they could afford it. And they had, uh, actually it so happens, all three members of the family had at least one serious medical problem. So for them, $3,000 rather than their, all their disposable income, obviously it was an improvement. So that was how the Affordable Care Act was designed to work. Um, it came online in 2014. And how did it do? Well, if you want the positive side of the ledger, we have the lowest recorded number of people without health insurance today. The number of uninsured plummeted. Um, which is what was predicted. Uh, the CBO had predicted it would get down to about, I mean, there's different, I, I hate to throw numbers out there because everybody uses a different baseline, but what you need to know is that we basically cut the number of uninsured in half, maybe a little better. And it's pretty close to what the original projections suggested from the Congressional Budget Office, from independent analysts. The sources of coverage are different than everyone expected. More people ended up getting coverage from Medicaid, less through these private insurance policies. But roughly speaking, you got lowest number of uninsured in modern times. And we have a lot of data to show that people have better access to health care as a result, that they have more financial protection. And there's some data, again, that suggests people are healthier as a result, although that's pretty ambiguous, certainly in real time. And that's just a hard thing to measure. And I always try to be careful in sort of saying that. So that would be the sort of upside, people would say. The downside, you've got a lot of people now paying for insurance that they think, on the private insurance side in particular, would say, wait a minute, these policies, you know, they're, they're, they're pretty skimpy. I'm looking at three, four, six thousand dollars in out-of-pocket costs on top of thousands of dollars in premiums. Yeah, I make fifty thousand dollars a year. I'm a family of three, but you know what? Fifty thousand dollars for a family of three income, that's not that much money. And I, you know, I got a kid heading off to college in a couple of years. I got car payments. This is not easy. So you have a lot of people who feel like the insurance is more than they can afford. Um, that has had a secondary effect. Uh, of making the markets more unstable in places because at some point some of these people are making fifty, sixty thousand dollars a year and saying, you know what, uh, I'm just not going to buy insurance. And who tends not to buy insurance? People who are in good health. So now the insurance companies aren't getting enough healthy people. They have to jack up rates, and you get into this cycle where they they, they keep raising their rates, and some of them have to leave the states where they are. And you've probably heard, you've probably read that you know there are states with only a lot of places with only one insurer. There's a few counties around the country where there are no insurers now. Reality, it's a very mixed picture if you go to California. Actually, here in Michigan, the markets are actually working pretty well, and most people have multiple choices of insurance. They're relatively cheap for most people. But if you go to Arizona, you go to Tennessee, you go to North Carolina, the, the costs are really high. And then particularly in rural areas, you are lucky to have one insurer. It's, it's, it's a real, you know, I think even defenders of the law would agree this is a weakness that needs to be addressed. Um, and uh, that is sort of the state of the program as we enter this political moment, uh, which is where we are now. Now, today, literally, uh, we are in the middle of a debate over whether to repeal the Affordable Care Act and then replace it with something. Um, and that something keeps changing. I'm tempted to look at my phone and see if it's changed in the last 20 minutes. Um, uh, and, and it's important to understand that the, the, the arguments against the Affordable Care Act, the arguments for repeal, a lot of them are grounded in long-standing critiques from conservatives, not just of the Affordable Care Act, but of Medicare and Medicaid, and uh, reasons that conservatives and don't like, think these plans are causing problems for the United States. And I would say they are sort of, you know, broadly speaking, part of the classic ideological debate we've been having in this country since the invention of the modern welfare state in the early 20th century. Um, there is a concern that, number one, these programs are expensive and getting more expensive and adding an ever less sustainable, ever less sustainable, ever more unsustainable, ever less sustainable, ever more unsustainable. This is what I do all day. I sit, in, I sit in front of my computer. Is it better to say less unsustainable, more sustainable? Welcome to my world. Um, uh, uh, you know, an ever larger, there, that's the phrase, ever larger burden on the federal budget. Um, and that money's got to come from somewhere. Either we're paying taxes for it, we're cutting spending elsewhere, we're tolerating higher deficits, which obviously has its own effects. That is a burden that needs to be met some way, somehow. Um, there is uh, a sense that these programs don't always work so well. That at best, they introduce weird incentives into the healthcare system, encouraging more spending, and at worst, they're just wasteful. I mean, Google Medicare fraud, Google Medicaid fraud, you'll find you know, all kinds of examples. Um, and uh, there is uh, you know, a sense, uh, a philosophical sense also that you know, maybe it's not right to ask people who are healthier or younger to pay extra because 
because uh, there are people who have higher medical bills. Maybe that's not the right way to do it. I mean, there's a philosophical question there as well. Like, to what extent should we ask younger, healthier people to pay more? The bills coming forward now uh, from uh, the Republicans are consistent with that views, those views. And if you look at the bills, I'm going to not, you know, as you may know, the House passed a bill a couple of months, weeks ago. Now the Senate is, I'm just going to talk about the Senate bill because everybody I talk to, everyone I hear basically says, if the Senate passes a bill, the House will just pass that straight. The House bill was there to give the House, Senate something to rewrite, and now the Senate's going to write it. And it's not a given, but it's unlikely the House will try to actually change it much. So what's in the Senate bill? The Senate bill, uh, number one, it tries to undo those reforms of the private market. Um, and here's where things really are like up to the minute changes. So the bill that was introduced about two weeks ago offered less financial assistance basically said, yeah, we're going to continue to offer people subsidies to help pay for their coverage, but it's going to be less money. And the assumption is that people will take this and buy skimpier insurance. So out-of-pocket costs, deductibles, copays, they were high today. Um, some people think they're too high. They would actually, on average, tend to get higher in the new bill because people would have less money. And the assumption is we've given less financial assistance to buy insurance, they would end up buying a less generous policy. So if today uh, you were buying a silver policy that would be expected to cover 70% of your medical costs, tomorrow you'd be expected to buy one that covers only 58% of your medical costs. And that's probably the difference between a policy that has a five, you know, $4,000 deductible and a $7,000 deductible or a $6,000 deductible and a higher deductible and higher co-pays. But one way or another, you're paying more in out-of-pocket costs. Um, at the same time, there was an effort to reduce the regulations on the insurance. And here's where things change today, whereas the new version of the bill includes an amendment that would basically let insurers, in a kind of roundabout way, which I can explain if you really want me to, uh, undo a lot, of those, so a lot of those new protections. So no longer would they always be required to give people insurance regardless of pre-existing condition. No longer would they be required to make sure everyone could get a policy with full essential health benefits. No longer would they be required that every policy had an annual or lifetime limit. The wrinkle here is that every insurer would have to offer such a policy still, but the way the market would evolve, it would become, it, you would no longer be guaranteed access to that. And it's complicated to explain and I'm simplifying a bit, but just trust me or you can wait three hours and read online at the HuffPost where my article will post that explains all the, all the details. Um, the, uh, on Medicaid, the bills would basically pull back the extra federal funding that allowed states to expand their Medicaid programs. So remember we talked about expanding it up to 100, you know, up to everybody in households with a, at or just above the poverty line. That's because the federal government puts up extra money, gives states a, you know, a bargain, says, look, if you expand it, we'll give you extra money. And the Senate bill basically says, nope, you know, as of 2020, we're going to start to claw that money back until it's not there anymore. And then on top of that, the bill basically says going forward, we're going to just change the way the federal government funds Medicaid altogether. Today, Medicaid is an open-ended commitment to basically cover as many people as qualify for the program, no matter how much they cover, at a fixed percentage of costs. So if you're Ohio, ooh, if you're Ohio and your costs go up, uh, the federal government will pay extra to match it as long as you're conforming to the rules of the program. Under the new system, that relationship would be broken. There are various options for how two different ways states could do this, but one way or another, that open-ended commitment would end. And the projections suggest that given the formulas that the Senate bill has, you would see this shortfall develop between what states would need to maintain their current benefits and what they'd be getting from Washington, and one way or another, they would end up cutting uh, their Medicaid programs. Now, there is an upside to all of this, and there is a downside to all of this. All, just like there was an upside to the Affordable Care Act, and there was a downside to the Affordable Care Act. The Affordable Care Act extant, expanded health insurance offerings, right? Made it available to more people. It's gotten more people health insurance. It also increased government spending, which means a higher tax burden at some point, some way or another. It introduced market regulations that a lot of people think are bad for the economy. Um, it made some healthy people have to pay more. What would this Senate bill? Well, in the Senate bill, actually, some of the people who you know, if you think of winners and losers, some of the losers under the Affordable Care Act would get that back. You would see people who are young and healthy people would be able to get cheaper, skimpier policies, kind of like they did in the old days, which for them, you know, they might think is absolutely a big win. I mean, if you're 25 years old, you don't want to have to pay for maternity care. Maybe you think it's, you know, it's not, you're not, you shouldn't have to pay for mental health care, you know, and you could get a much cheaper policy. Um, government spending would come down, the tax burden would come down. The flip side is that, you know, you'd actually 
lose the protections and the benefits of the Affordable Care Act too. You wouldn't see this. You, something like 20 million people are going to lose health insurance. That's going to mean more financial distress, less access to health care, et cetera. Um, the Medicaid cuts in particular, states are almost certainly going to have to pull back. And just to give you an example of what that would, you know, two examples of what that would mean, um, you know, if you think about how this all works out, I mentioned, you know, that family in North Carolina that's dependent on the ACA. That story I actually also wrote about a family in North Carolina that's paying a lot more for their health insurance today because of the ACA. They probably end up saving money under the Senate bill. This, you know, they were, they're a little more affluent, they're in relatively good health, they're probably happy with the, they don't feel like they need all these expansive benefits. For them, the Senate bill is probably a net plus financially, at least in the near future, you know, as long as they don't get sick. They, and there are a lot of people like that. The flip side is that other family I described, the one that's getting those subsidies, they probably end up with no insurance at all. And they have, like I said, a series of serious medical problems, and they're going to be stuck. And that's the trade-off here. I mean, you can help one group, but you're going to hurt another group. There's always trade-offs in health policy. And so, you know, the question, if you sort of want to think in the big picture, and I already went longer than I want to, so I'm going to wrap this up. But, you know, the simplest way to think about this, I always think, is that at the end, you know, we talked about this burden of medical care, this burden, financial burden of medical care. It costs a lot of money. Who is paying that? And, and the ultimate question here is, who's bearing the risk at the end of the day? To what extent do you want to make those responsibility for medical bills, do you want to put that on individuals? To what extent do you want to say to people, it's up to you whether you have the right job, and if you don't, you know, whether you can get the right insurance, and if you can't, then you have to make up the difference. And to what extent do you want to say that society as a whole is going to pick up that responsibility? And remember, there are trade-offs to both. If you do it the former way, which is the way that we used to do it, and the way the Senate bill would, would uh, take us in, then you are leaving those individuals vulnerable. The government is smaller, spending is down, and uh, the, you, know, you have a freer market operating. If you keep the system as it is, or you move more in that direction, you keep moving towards a universal system, well, the downside is now you're putting that burden on the taxpayers. Every single person here you know, eventually is going to have to support that system. You're going to be regulating the private industry. You're going to be telling markets how to operate. The flip side is that, you know, you get to a system where it doesn't matter if you're poor, it doesn't matter what your income is, it doesn't matter what your medical condition is, you will have access to health care. And it's basically a question, the ultimate question here is, whose responsibility is this? Who is going to be on the hook here if medical care ends up costing a lot more money than you want? Is it the individuals who have individual medical bills or is it society? And that's really what this debate is all about. And if you tune in in about a week, you'll see how it turns out. trying to see if any more senators came out against it. All right, so uh, while I'm checking to see, uh, we were at two senators, by the way, the, the actual, if you want raw politics here, the deal is they need 50 votes in the Senate. There's two votes next week. There'll be a motion to proceed, which means they're going to begin the debate, and then there's a vote on the bill at the end. Um, because of the rules they're using, they can do this with 50, 50, it takes only 50 votes. Two senators, Senator Collins from Maine and Senator Paul from Kentucky have both already said, no, we are, we are no votes. Everyone was, last when I looked at my Twitter feed before I started talking, everybody was waiting to hear from uh, Senator Capito from West Virginia, who's very worried about the impact of Medicaid cuts on West Virginia, Senator Heller from Nevada, very worried about the impact of Medicaid cuts in Nevada, and a couple others, and I'm not seeing anything about them yet. So as far as I know, we are still not sure how this is all going to turn out. There you go. Okay. <laughs> Up to the date news. Actually, so there you go. Anybody have any questions? I think, did you want to do it? Yeah. So you kind of elaborated really well on um, what I would consider the minute benefits of the new Senate bill. Could you perhaps elaborate on the motivations of current Congress beyond the fact that um, younger people will have an opportunity to purchase more skin care insurance plans and families will have an opportunity to save more money by not um, paying necessarily for services they don't think they need in the near future. Okay, so, um, I, to, to be fair, I mean, there are, you know, so first of all, we have the new bill has to go through a CBO score, and, and like, there's so many moving pieces in these, I feel, I, I, I should, the standard disclaimers, I can't say definitively how that new version shakes out, it's got a couple different bells and whistles in it. Literally, we're all, I was sitting there, you know, reading the bill, like, I don't know, 
you know, I'm talking to my economist friends, and so we don't know exactly yet. Assuming it looks like what we do, um, you know, in terms of the motivations, uh, look, I mean, I think, you know, why would you? I mean, so the question, I mean, if if I can translate your question or make sure I understand what you're asking, I mean, you're moving from a system that offers more protection overall to less protection. That is clearly the case. And that's clearly the case because you've drained money out of federal health programs. I mean, that's as simple as it. It's a money shift. There's money now going to help people pay for their medical care, either through Medicaid or through assistance, people buying private insurance, and also through chain, you know, a shift between the healthy and the sick. And now you're reducing that. So that is going to mean less access. So why would you do that? Well, that's money you don't have to provide. So it's a, again, it is a smaller tax. I mean, I think a big part of this is if you're Really, one of these, you know, I think people who are worried about the fiscal burden that's placed on the budget, they're like, we need to just, you know, there's a, we need to cut that, you know, need to cut that off over I mean, there's a mentality of these entitlements are out of control. I think this is the Paul Ryan keg party mentality in part. You know, oh my God, this is costing so much money. If you get a chance to limit how much one of these programs do, you jump at it and you don't care what it means because otherwise we're all going to, you know, can't, we can't pay for all this. So that would be one of um, another motivation, I think, is a philosophical one. I mean, I do think, and if you listen, and, and again, maybe Paul Ryan I would put in this category because I've heard him talk about this a lot, and, and I am not putting a value judgment on this, is there is a principled argument that it's not my responsibility. That, you know, at some point, I'm working hard, and this is my paycheck, and I'm, you know, struggling, and why am I suddenly now, I used to pay $3,000 for my insurance, now I'm paying $7,000 for my insurance. I can't afford seven. And you know, there's a whole argument that, well, are you really paying $7,000? And are you sure you're better off? Because did you know you're old? But you know, that would be, I think, the motivation. You know, um, you know, there's it's redistribution. I mean, I, I, and and I, many of us, I this is some people would consider this a contra well, I don't know, I think I mean, I've written a million times, but I mean, fundamentally, insurance is a form of redistribution. It's a form of redistribution from healthy to sick rich to poor. And there's a lot of people who just don't believe in that. And if you don't believe in that, then you know, you're know you going to hate the Affordable Care Act because that's what it does. You know, you're going to hate any universal health care system. Um, Social Security does the same thing, you know, et cetera, et cetera. Government programs redistribute, and the Affordable Care Act redistributes. It does so awkwardly and in many ways inefficiently and in many ways that haven't worked nearly the way the architects intended. But I think there are people who, you know, they object to that. And then, you know, and there's a principle, I think a very principled economic argument that, you know what, government, you know, you start messing with markets and the ultimate, you know, general welfare is worse off. And, and, and to give that argument its due, I think it's actually important. I would say this is true. This can cut either way, depending on how you see it. But it's always true to think about not just the healthcare system when you're thinking about the healthcare system. So, you know, again, when I was talking about people who say we can't spend so much money on healthcare, you know, it is a fact of life. If you're spending a lot of money on healthcare, that is that much less to spend on other things. Now, whether in fact cutting the Affordable Care, you know, whether cutting the money out of the Affordable Care Act means us to spend more on education, for example, is a separate question. But nevertheless, I mean, there is a, we do live in a world of limited resources. So those, I would think, are the principal reasons. Um, I'm not going to speculate on like who believes what and why, just because I can't transport myself. I mean, this kind of seems like a opportunity for like a ping pong match where like if political power shifts, it could go the other way again. Is that true? In the, like, and if so, what would have to give for a settlement of like a working the health care system? So um, I can imagine. I just actually, I can imagine two. Let's say well, I'll give you two ways this could play. Three ways this could play out. So something passes. Um, Something passes, then uh, you know, do we get to a point where there's a political backlash to it? Maybe. You know, who knows? You never know how these things are going. And could you imagine a system, you know, a, a backlash where people who see the opposite viewpoint as to imagine Democrats taking the House and the Senate and the presidency in 2020. So let's imagine it's President Bernie Sanders or President Elizabeth Warren and you know, uh, majority, you know, House Speaker. Maybe. Uh, and, you know, Majority Leader Schumer, do they get in, you know, whether, you know, and even if they don't pass anything, could, could you imagine a, a situation where they get into office? Yeah, I can imagine that. Um, 
Where do they get? I don't know how far they get in terms of you know creating a different system. Um, it's, 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 it's hard to know. I mean, I, my read on the politics of this is that it's bad politics for the Republicans right now. Um, the, the calculation a lot of Republicans are making, and, and, and I want to be very clear about this, Republicans are very much thinking about their political futures. When Democrats did the Affordable Care Act, they were very much thinking about their political futures. Everybody thinks about their political futures. Um, you know, the calculation Republicans are making right now is, is voting for this bill better or worse for me politically than not voting? I will tell you my read on it, that if I'm a Republican, I'm not better off voting for this bill. I'm better off finding some kind of, letting this bill fail, getting into talks with Democrats, passing a small bill. Um, Republicans, most of them disagree. And the reason they disagree is their calculation is that failing to follow through on a promise and potentially alienating members of their base has a, has a, has a, a bigger political cost than passing a bill that appears to be very unpopular. And there's no way to test that proposition because we'll never get to run two versions of history. Um, so I don't know where they end up. Um, but you know, I would think either way, yeah, you can imagine a backlash. Um, you know, where that ends up, it's so hard to say. I do think two things are different. I've been thinking about this a lot. I'm actually thinking about writing more, regardless of how this turns out, about you know, thinking seriously about single payer, or things like single payer, and how you get to it. And I'd say there's two things that have changed since 10 years ago or 20 years ago when Democrats kind of went down this path. You know, one is that now we've had a chance to run an experiment on this sort of public-private hybrid. And whether you think it's been total failure or totally successful, even like I think the most wild optimists and enthusiasts about this would agree it's not as, you know, it's not achieving what they would want. And that's proved tougher than they thought. It's not getting to where a single they would hope a single payer system. So that might create more enthusiasm for it, and both politically and as policy. So you can imagine that. And I even like there was a comment from the CEO of Aetna, who I got to tell you, I, I've interviewed him before, and he says kind of wild and crazy things, and you're never sure that what he says one week is the same. Smart guy, by the way, who's listening to this on some of the podcasts. <laughs> uh, 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 you know, he at some point was like, well, you know, we, we, we do the benefits for Medicare, so maybe, you know, we could do benefits for a single payer system. Now, I don't know, maybe he was just talking, you know, out of this other body part. But, um, uh, you know, it's not crazy to think you could come up with a single payer system where private insurance still had a role, right? Maybe like in Medicare today, when people can opt into private insurance. And you can imagine various mixes along the way. So I don't know. I mean, I do feel like there's more of a chance of kind of swinging over to single payer or something like <coughs> it, regardless of how this debate turns out, in part because of this debate. And there are a lot of people, a lot of liberals and Democrats, who were not thrilled with this, the, the concept of the Affordable Care Act, but kind of swallowed hard because, like, this is the best we can get, and we need to do this to make it work. And a lot of them are like, wait a minute. We made all these compromises and we're still having these problems? Well, shoot, might as well kind of, you know, try to shoot the moon. Hearts players out here, you know what that means? Yeah, okay. That's our favorite family game. Like, 13 girls all excited. Okay. Jonathan, early in your talk, you said you thought this would be settled in the next few weeks. Is there a chance it might not be, and we're going to be continuing to hear this debate for months or maybe till the midterm elections? I, I, you're trying to get Amy like running out the door screaming, right? She's like, or that she's like, be like, a, oh my gosh, it's five o'clock. <laughs> um, it is five o'clock. Um, uh, I mean, I assume we'll be debating this forever. I mean, what's interesting, I, we're going to keep debating healthcare. When I said settled, so that you're, uh, now that I think about it, that's probably right. It's not settled, clearly. Um, in fact, the real lesson of the Affordable Care Act, I think we've all learned, is that this is not nearly as settled as you think. I mean, I remember when the Affordable Care Act passed, I sort of figured, all right, that fight's over. Now I'll go back to the usual back and forth. And well, I'm not gonna be like it's not gonna be this crazy every night, honey. I mean, you know, it's fine, whatever. Um, but uh, you know, I mean, if this thing passes, I mean, this is one of the things I think Republicans aren't quite processing in their own calculations. And again, they may be right. They may be right that passing this bill is still the politically smart move for them. I don't think they have priced into the stock of passing the bill um, the fact that, uh, in the same way, Republicans did not go quietly away after the, you know. Obama signed that thing, I guarantee you liberals aren't going to go away, Democrats are going to go away if Trump signs a bill. Um, you know, it's maybe like that Obi-Wan, you strike me down, I'm maybe even more powerful than you, know, whatever. There's <laughs> Tom, you love Star Wars reference. Yeah, there he is. Um, so uh, uh, we'll be debating this a lot. I do think, I actually, 
There is one scenario where I think we get past this debate, though. I think it's really important, because I think this is a live possibility, which is bill fails, and you get a bipartisan, very small, but not totally insignificant bill that sort of shores up the system where it's weak throws a little money at insurance companies to cover their highest cost people. There's, there's, there's you know, uh, they fund these extra subsidies for insurers that they've not been getting lately. And basically, maybe there's a, there's something in there that Republicans can call a win. Maybe they get more, you know, more age very, they, they more flexibility to change things on the state level. And insurers, they, you know, how they can do three to one age rating now, maybe they go up to four to one. Not five, maybe, because that's a real budget buster. Four maybe works. And everyone kind of calls it a day. And then we're back to the old debates, you know, and Republicans and will say, we should block grant Medicare, we should privatize Medicare, block grant Medicaid, privatize Medicare, shrink the subsidies, and Democrats will say, we should have a public option, and we should eventually have a single payer system, we should tell the drug companies how much they can charge. And we'll be back to that debate, which will feel normal. <laughs> which seems so nice right now. I really need to sleep, so. Oh, good. <laughs> Uh, so you spoke earlier about how it would be much more difficult for people with pre-existing conditions to buy insurance. What about people with current conditions? So for example, someone with, who's fighting cancer at the time the new law comes into effect, what will happen to their care and insurance? So that is a good question, if you have a condition right now. Um, you know, insurers would count that as a pre-existing condition, right? I mean, that's what would happen. And uh, so obviously if you, the way these, these new plans all work is that you lose your guaranteed access to insurance if it lapses, which was true before, by the way. So, you know, if you have insurance and you can keep it up, then your insurance will stay. But if you, for some reason, you drop insurance, you lose your job, you go from being, uh, you know, uh, 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 from once, there are various conditions that could cause this, then once you lose it, you could have trouble getting it again. But the flip side is, and this is so important, I'm glad you asked this, is that some of the changes very quietly would affect insurance policies that people have, even the good ones. So remember I mentioned that uh, one of the changes in both the House and the Senate bill is that they would uh, loosen the regulations on private insurance. Because the way that is written, any insurance policy potentially, even an employer policy, even the wonderful University of Michigan health insurance policy, um, you could see a, a restoration of annual and lifetime limits. So if you're someone fighting cancer, and you know, it's very easy with cancer, you know, it does not take that long to get a million dollars in bills. I mean, they, they go up quick. And it doesn't have to be some rare condition either. I mean, just you know, anything like that. Um, you could find yourself in a situation where you hit that limit, and now you're like, now you're stuck. And how are you going to pay for your medical care? Um, it's not, I want to be careful to say that's not guaranteed to happen under the House and Senate bill. Depending on how the, 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 the design has worked, a lot of this is at state discretion. It depends on your employer. Not every, you know, in the old days, lots of people had insurance policies that didn't have annual or lifetime limits. So it's not guaranteed that it would happen, but you'd be vulnerable to that. And, and you know, that's part of the equation here. I mean, again, it's more protection. You know, this, the, the Republican bills would mean less protection, full stop. They would also mean less government spending. Uh, they would mean less interference in the free market, full stop. And those are the trade-offs. I mean, that's, it's a straight-up trade-off, and that's what it is, and that's what we're debating. Thank you so much for speaking with us. Um, my question pertains to the overall health of Americans. Despite how much we spend on health care, we're still unhealthy. So is there a place in the health care reform discussion for understanding the roots of poor health, and do you see this manifesting in this shaping of health care bills anytime soon? So, we are very unhealthy as a country, yes. Um, there are a lot of reasons for that that have actually not that much to do with medical care. The primary determinant of health, as I'm sure a lot of people in this room could tell you better than I could, uh, income status, where you grew up, environment, um, medical care as it's currently constituted has very little to do with that. That said, there are you know, a couple ways that medical care can improve health. Um, the first is that if it makes you more financially secure, you're less likely to be in poverty, less likely to be in poverty, you're less likely to have these problems. So I mean, there's a kind of indirect effect there. People forget that sometimes, you know. Anything that sort of helps people be more economically secure is gonna make them healthier over time, we know that. In addition, uh, there are certainly, the Affordable Care Act actually had a lot of money, uh, relatively speaking, plowed into sort of public health and prevention funds. 
Um, now, I will say the, 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 the Senate bill does throw a lot more money at, at one particular cause, which is treatment of opioid addiction, um, which is a health problem, obviously. Now, you talk to anyone who does this and looks at the dollars, there's sort of a lot, there's sort of a give here and then there's a take here and the net result is a lot less money into. But still, there's that and you know, credit where due. Um, one other thing is that um, there is a lot of innovative medicine out there that really does try to focus on making people healthier. And the Affordable Care Act indirectly subsidizes a lot of this. Um, I have one example, just because I happen to be, I have a story coming on this in three days, depending on what happens in the next three days. It's already written and edited. Um, I, about two weeks ago, I was up in Flint. Um, and uh, actually, two examples from Flint. Um, a lot of you know uh, uh, the story of the Flint water crisis. Uh, not everyone knows that you know the, the sort of key moment in that they wouldn't know, people must hear know Mona, Mona Deja, right? Right, okay, so you guys know her, okay. So this is the famous, one of the two people who like helped expose the Flint medical crisis, the water crisis, and that's because she had data showing high blood levels among you know kids and families in Flint. Well, where did that data come from? It came from the hospital records of Hurley Medical Center. Why did Hurley Medical Center have all this data on lead? Because Medicaid, the e, something called the EPSDT program, mandates testing and pays for testing low-income kids of lead because lead is a very big hazard in low-income communities. Partly, a lot of them, I mean, I remember hearing about this in Los Angeles like 15 years ago. So many of the houses don't lead paint. You know, if you're affluent, you buy a house, you get a lead inspection. You know, if you're making $13,000 a year and you're, you're paying nothing for an apartment, I promise you there's a good chance your landlord didn't do the lead inspection. So, you know, Medicaid mandates that and with, it doesn't always work. Mandate like everything else in Medicaid, some places they do it, some places they don't. But that data was what eventually forced everyone to say, oh my gosh, yes, we have lead in the water. Because you remember, the officials were like, no, no, the water's safe, it's fine. So, um, but what, so I went up to that, so that's one way Medicaid helps health, in a kind of indirect way, you know, whatever. Um, the other thing was, I went up to the clinic, the Hurley has now a new downtown clinic, which is beautiful, by the way. You guys all been to Flint? I don't know how much you've been to Flint, but like, it's this gorgeous new building, and they actually show the farmer's market and they have this really cool program where if you're a kid and you go to the Hurley Children's Center, when you leave, you get a food prescription. It's a $10 voucher to take next door to the farmer's market. You can only use it on fresh produce. Kids love it. They're like, that's awesome. You know, you go there, you buy the fresh produce, whatever. And obviously, you know, it's a, it's a, it's a neat little gimmick. And partly just they, they want, they, they're trying to make coming to the clinic a more interesting, kind of pleasant experience for most of the people who come. But obviously part of this is, Hey, guess what? You know, you know, Flint, not always easy to get fresh, you know, produce. Diets aren't always great. Here you go, you build these habits. Now they're studying this, and we'll see if it actually makes a difference or not. But I've been to clinics all over the country, and I'm always impressed that these, these clinics that serve low-income populations, uninsured, they have the least resources, and some of them do the most creative things. And you're just always amazed. They've got social workers, and counselors, and nutritionists, and with the Affordable Care Act, extra money they've gotten because there's so many more people covered. A lot of these places are doing a lot more of that. And, you know, if you know about the social determinants of health and you know about all the sort of factors that go into it, like something as, you know, having, for example, counselors who work with families in crisis, that actually can do a lot to improve health, right? I mean, if you know about the social determinants of health, that kind of thing. And I have seen that in Los Angeles, in Cleveland, in New Orleans. Uh, I was amazed. I was down in New Orleans a couple months ago at a clinic there, and like you would think, I mean, that's like you know ground zero for like nutrition, obesity, you know that. Yeah, you know, and and you've been to Louisiana, and it's like a walking like you know diet crisis. Uh, I lived there for three months. I can say that. But um, you know, this clinic was like they're, they're like investing all this money in nutrition and counseling, and like they have cooking classes and. You know, who knows how much that stuff actually works? They got to study that stuff. But to me, those are really promising ways that you can help that. And I, you know, I think there's probably a lot of interest in doing more of that. I mean, even you know, and, and bipartisan. You know, community clinics actually are something that has traditionally drawn bipartisan support. So again, if you get past this repeal debate, you know, in an ideal world, you would imagine a world where there's more money into this kind of thing. I think we're gonna have to. That's right. Off yes. Now, because we're way past time. Thanks everyone for staying. Thank you.